In this video, we're going to introduce lipids, the different classes of lipids, and which lipids are essential. We'll describe the different roles of lipids in our body, including the functions of triglycerides, phospholipids, and cholesterol esters. Then we're going to move on and talk about fatty acids, which are important parts of all three of those lipids, and how the diversity of fatty acids and their structure dictates how they pack, how soluble they are, and their effects on our human health. We're going to finish with talking about essential fatty acids, the polyunsaturated fatty acids omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, what they do and why they're essential. The AMDR for dietary fat is 20 to 35% of our energy intake per day. Most people in America tend to be a little closer to 35% than 20%. We also have specific intake limits. The recommendation is to consume less than 10% of our calories from saturated fats. For somebody eating a 2000 calorie diet, that would be 200 calories, or because the Atwater factor of fat is nine grams per calorie, 22 grams of saturated fat per day. It is also recommended that cholesterol is as low as possible within a nutritionally adequate diet. Trans fats, a particular class of fatty acids, are now banned from our food supply, so we should be consuming little to no trans fatty acids. Polyunsaturated fatty acids, omega-6s and omega-3s, have adequate intakes set. They vary between men and women, 12 grams to 17 grams per day for omega-6, and 1.3 to 1.6 grams per day for omega-3s. The higher number is for men. There are three major types of lipids, triglycerides, phospholipids, and steroids. In each of these cases, a fatty acid chain can be attached to a glycerol in the case of triglyceride, two fatty acids to a glycerol with a phospholipid head group in the case of a phospholipid, or a fatty acid can be attached to a cholesterol group, shown on the right. Cholesterol can exist in two forms, either a free form, shown on the left, note the free hydroxyl group in the bottom left corner, or in a sterified form. That means a fatty acid is now conjugated to that free hydroxyl group. In this case, I'm showing you the fatty acid oleic acid. When cholesterol is esterified, it has different properties. It is much less soluble and is also difficult for us to absorb without breaking off that fatty acid chain. Cholesterol has several important roles in our bodies. Cholesterol sometimes gets a bad reputation, but cholesterol is absolutely essential for every cell in our body. It's a component of cell membranes and enhances cellular membrane fluidity. Cholesterol is also a precursor to several important body compounds, such as bile salts and several hormones, including testosterone, estrogen, and even vitamin D. Cholesterol is not an essential nutrient. We do not need to eat it because it can be made by almost every cell in the body. However, excess levels of cholesterol in our blood is linked to heart disease. This is analogous to excess levels of glucose in our blood is linked to diabetes. The next class are phospholipids. Phospholipids are characterized by a head group. This is a charged group, generally, with two fatty acids attached to it. The head group here is shown in blue. Because it's partially hydrophilic, the head group, and partially hydrophobic, the fatty acid, phospholipids are used as amphipathic barriers and make up a lot of our cellular membranes. Shown on the right is an example of a cellular membrane. The aqueous head group is facing water, whereas two bilayers of the fatty acid groups are on the inside. This is one way by which cells can separate themselves from their environment. Different phospholipids are dictated by the different head groups. Shown here are several different head groups. In the top row, you can see phosphatidylserine, phosphatidylethanolamine, phosphatidylinositol, and phosphatidylcholine. For each of these, there's a different head group shown in red, and then there's two fatty acid chains, abbreviated as R1 and R2 to save space. The different head groups dictate the different function of those different phospholipids. Some head groups are better for different membranes. In terms of dietary fat, 95% of the calories you consume from fat are in the form of triglycerides. This is a glycerol with three fatty acid chains attached to it. This is the largest energy store in our body, far, far more than the amount of energy stored in glycogen. Triglycerides are generally stored in lipid droplets with inside cells, along with the cholesterol esters. The major source of triglyceride storage in our bodies is our adipose tissue. All three of these classes of lipids, triglycerides, cholesterol esters, and phospholipids, have different fatty acid chains, and those different fatty acid chains affect the properties of those lipids as well. There's three major classes of fatty acid chains. Saturated fatty acids, those with no double bonds, monounsaturated fatty acids, those with a single double bond, and polyunsaturated fatty acids, those with more than one double bond. So let's see what that would look like. Shown on the top is stearic acid. It is a saturated fatty acid. It has no double bond. Shown on the bottom is oleic acid. 
It's a fatty acid that has one double bond. That makes it a monounsaturated fatty acid. That bond is in what we call cis orientation. What that means is that double bond introduces a kink in the structure of oleic acid. That means it's harder to pack oleic acid together because they have irregular structures. A ledaic acid, shown in the center, is a trans fatty acid. No, it's still a monounsaturated fatty acid. It still has one double bond. It's still in the same location as the version in oleic acid, but it is now in trans orientation. You'll notice when a fatty acid is a trans fatty acid, it now looks more like a saturated fat than a monounsaturated fat. Trans fats are generally produced by the hydrogenation of vegetable oils when that hydrogenation is incomplete. For example, you might want to make a shelf stable fat, so you take oleic acid and then you try to get rid of the double bond. That makes a lot of stearic acid, which is now solid and is more shelf stable, but on the other hand, you make a small amount of the trans fatty acids. These became very abundant in our food supply. What we've learned, if we look at the different fatty acid compositions in our diet and how they relate to mortality, and specifically cardiovascular disease, is that trans fatty acids, shown on the top on the graph on the right, have the highest cardiovascular risk on a per energy basis. Because trans fats are not essential in our diet, that made the decision to ban trans fats relatively easy, although it took many years to implement. Saturated fats are also associated with increased mortality, whereas monounsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats tend to be associated with decreased mortality. Again, mostly due to decreased cardiovascular disease risk. If we look at fat consumption from 1900 to about 2010, you can see that this has changed. For example, in the early 1900s, we consumed large amounts of both lard and butter. However, as people became more conscious of dietary cholesterol, the amount of lard people consumed and the amount of butter they consumed decreased. This was replaced by margarine, largely generated by hydrogenated vegetable oils. However, you can see this peaked in around 1990. That's about when we figured out that trans fats were so problematic. Since trans fats existed in margarine, margarine consumption has decreased, and this has now largely been replaced by palm oil, which is a naturally occurring but still solid fat. What about the PUFAs? The omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids are essential in our diet. The reason for that is we do not have enzymes that can introduce double bonds at the omega-3 or omega-6 positions. Therefore, we need to obtain these from our diet. This can be obtained from both plant sources in the form of linoleic, the omega-6 fatty acid, or alpha-linolenic, the omega-3 fatty acid. They can also be obtained in fish oils, which are in the form of DHA and EPA, shown on the right. Now, interestingly, the bioactive forms of omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids are arachidonic acid for omega-6 and EPA and DHA for omega-3 fatty acids. So even if we consume linoleic acid or alpha-linolenic acid, we need to convert them into arachidonic acid, EPA, and DHA for some of their biological effects. Unfortunately, this rate of conversion is quite inefficient in most people. Shown on the right is the efficiency of conversion of dietary ALA, or omega-3 fatty acid, into either DHA or EPA. You can see it varies both by sex and by the end product. We generally consume about one gram per day as a population of alpha-linolenic acid. This is less than the adequate intake. We consume even less of EPA and DHA. There's important sex and genetic differences that explain differences in individuals' rate of conversion of ALA into EPA and DHA, and also linoleic acid into arachidonic acid. Therefore, it's been suggested that direct supplementation of EPA and DHA may be more beneficial because it doesn't rely on this inefficient conversion. So what do these fatty acids do? Let's start with the omega-6 fatty acids. As I said, the bioactive form of the omega-6 fatty acid is the product arachidonic acid, generated from linoleic acid. Arachidonic acid can be acted on by a variety of enzymes called cyclooxygenases or lipoxygenases to generate products called leukotrienes, prostaglandins, and thromboxanes. Leukotrienes are important to promote inflammation in white blood cells. They're also important for our adaptive immune function. Thromboxanes, on the other hand, play important roles in blood clotting. Prostaglandins, among other roles, play roles in vasodilation. These are important biological processes. We need to have inflammation. We need to make blood clots when we need to. We need to have vasodilation. That's why we need to get omega-6 precursors from our diet to be able to have enough arachidonic acid to generate these bioactive products as necessary. But what about omega-3 fatty acids? Well, they also have a number of roles. Omega-3 fatty acids, in general, are anti-inflammatory, or they're resolving. 
they compete with omega-3 fatty acids. So whereas arachidonic acid-derived prostaglandins and leukotrienes are pro-inflammatory, the same products generated by cyclooxygenases and lipoxygenases are either anti-inflammatory or have low inflammation. Therefore, omega-3s are generally thought to be metabolically beneficial, or maybe the good PUFAs. That's because they are anti-inflammatory, while omega-6s are generally pro-inflammatory. But remember, both of them are essential. There's diseases associated with reduced omega-6 and reduced omega-3 inflammation. Generally, in Western diets, we consume a lot more omega-6 fatty acids than we consume omega-3s, generally about 15 to 1. Now, this can be a problem. Because shown on the right is the enzymatic pathways by which omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids are converted into their products. They use the same enzymes. There's not omega-6 or omega-3 specific delta-6 desaturases or elongases. Since they use the same enzymes, they compete with each other. That means that having high levels of omega-6 fatty acids actually impairs the conversion of omega-3 fatty acids into EPA and DHA. In summary, lipids play several important roles in our body. They're important parts of energy storage, insulation, can generate hormones, and can control our inflammation. They come in several forms. The important ones are triglycerides, phospholipids, and sterols. Phospholipids are amphipathic and provide cellular barriers, whereas triglycerides are major energy stores. Individual fatty acids can be attached in a variety of different ways to phospholipids, triglycerides, or cholesterol esters, and the structure of different fatty acids affects their packing and solubility. There's two specific fatty acids, both polyunsaturated fatty acids that are essential in our diet. We can ingest lipids in a variety of different forms in a variety of different chemical structures. They can have different head groups and they can have different fatty acid chains. We know a lot of how, how different fatty acid intakes affect particular human diseases, particularly cardiovascular disease. Consumption of trans fats is highly linked to cardiovascular disease, whereas consumption of monounsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats tend to prevent cardiovascular disease. We still are trying to figure out why this is the case and why certain individuals are at risk of certain lipid-induced cardiovascular risk. This is an important question to ask, as cardiovascular disease is a major cause of death in most societies.